experience, and that's a pretty big deal. Uh, not only is he an expert in that, but he's actually a certified neuroscientist. And that's, that's, a, that's awesome. And along with that, he's had some experience as an elementary school teacher. So he's had a pretty broad level of experience. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the awesome Joe Leach. So let's give him a hand. Hi everybody, how you doing? Uh, so is it okay if, if we take a bit of a selfie, do you mind? Can everybody sort of get in a bit and smile? Is that all right? Just because my mum likes to know what I'm up to and she knows if like, I'm here with nice looking, honest American people, she's gonna feel really happy about everything that we're doing. So there we go, look, there's a selfie of all of us, me and 400 of my closest American friends. Come on, wave a bit, wave, hello, come on. There we go, I can see you through the screen, you see, thanks very much, folks. All right. Okay, so, um, quick show of hands then. Hands up if you've uh, ever visited the Museum of Modern Art in New York's website. You've been, been there? Yeah, great. Ever bought a Raspberry Pi? Ever done that before? Yeah. Ever booked a hotel on uh, Marriott.com before? Done that? Ever bought a train ticket online in the UK? Ever done that before? Brilliant. Ever returned anything? Ever bought anything on eBay before? Yeah, great. So you've all used something that I've designed over the last sort of 14 years or so. Most of those projects have been in the last sort of 18 months or so. Um, so yeah, my name is Joe, Joe Leach, and as Ray said, I am a user experience and a um, product design um, person, consultant, I suppose. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about how to design a fantastic UX using some psychology principles that I learned way back when on my neuroscience degree. I did a master's in human computer interaction, and I'm going to compress that whole four years of academic study for you today so you can practically use psychology when you get back to the office on Monday to make your designs as good as they possibly can be. So what I do, so what I do these days is I help big organizations like the ones I mentioned before, as well as startups to do the right things in the right order. So I'm an independent consultant and I help teams like yourselves just to do the things you know you should be doing for the right reasons to make your users happy and to get business results. That's the stuff I do. I've also written a book. It's called Psychology for Designers, and it does what it says on the cover. It's a guide to psychology for designers like you. Really cheap, it's about $4. Um, anybody, anybody ever bought it? Oh, a few of you have. Have you actually read it, though? That's the thing, because people buy it, because it's really cheap, and never get around to reading. I don't mind if you don't read it, but please do buy it, at the very least. That would be lovely. Um, Okay then, so let's get going. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about two, probably three things. So I'm gonna, the first thing I'm gonna to talk to you about is, uh, is some quick high level psychology practices and understandings to help us understand how people are using our digital products in their everyday lives, things we need to think about. And then in part two, I'm gonna talk about a framework to design user uh, interactions, interaction designs, as well as a framework for product innovation to design better user experiences, both using the power of psychology. Okay, let's get going. Right, understanding people and their lives. Question for you. In October 2011, Dubai noticed a 20% drop in car accidents. In Abu Dhabi, it was a great whopping 40%. Do you know why? What happened? No, it wasn't Ramadan. No, any, anything else? Designs of street signage, I heard. No, no, it wasn't. Wonderful. The BlackBerry service went down for 48 hours. Remember BlackBerry? Anyway, back then it was the default messaging service that everybody was using. It went down for 48 hours and there was a massive drop in car accidents. Okay? What does that tell us about us humans and our lives? It tells us two things. Number one, we're really, really bad at doing two things at the same time. And number two, we think we're really good at doing two things at the same time, which is fundamentally a really difficult proposition. So how does that affect the stuff you're designing? Now, hopefully people aren't using the stuff you're designing whilst driving. That would, of course, be illegal these days. Um, familiar with this television program? Americans Got Talent, I think this is. Uh, sorry, yeah, this was invented by Brits. Really sorry we gave this to you. Absolutely awful stuff. <laughs> What are around about 40% of people doing while they're watching America's Got Talent? What are they doing? Yeah, when I ask that question in the UK, people say things like, drinking a cup of tea, <laughs> which I love. I always, that's always the default answer in the UK. They're using their cell, and their, um, their cell phones and their iPads or their laptops whilst they're watching TV. And it's crazy, so about half of all smartphone and tablet users 
use these devices whilst watching TV. This stat is about 18 months old. I'm guessing that number's only going one way. So what does that tell us about the stuff that we are designing? That tells us people are distracted and not giving 100% focus to the stuff they're, that they're, they're using whilst watching TV. So anybody using a laptop now, thinking you're listening to me, you're not, all right? You're not. So if you want to close your laptop, you'll get a lot more out of this talk from uh, just listening to me. It, it's not illegal, by the way. You're not going to get arrested for doing that. All right. So the first principle is distraction. Secondly, then, this is a fantastic study that was done in Israel. And this was done, a study that looked at judicial decisions, so decisions by judges in Israeli courts, and they mapped it against time of the day. So on the left-hand side is favorable decisions, and then across the bottom axis is, uh, is time of the day. What do you think the, uh, those hatch lines represent? What times of the day? Just before morning break and just before lunch. So what effectively this is telling us is when people are hungry, they're not, they don't make the best decisions in the world. And look, it's stark. The proportion of favorable decisions is hugely lower around about just before lunch. And I love to say now, I'm on just before lunch, <laughs> which is a, in a wonderful piece of irony when I'm on stage, which I absolutely love. Um, so please, when you're completing your, uh, your forms, keep this in mind, all right, your feedback forms. Add two or three points just for the fact it's before lunch. Um, and this tells us that people are tired and hungry at certain points of the day. So if you go and you check your web stats, people are using your app just around lunchtime, they're going to be tired and hungry, a bit annoyed, a bit narky, a bit pissed off, and they will be making bad decisions just before lunch. Okay? Something worth thinking about. So again, if you get caught texting whilst driving, and your court date is just before lunch, watch out. <laughs> All right. And this, this is what this kind of stuff leads to. So this is some, some work I did. This is from some user testing. I'm tired. I've had a hard day. The last thing I want to do is my car insurance after, after work. All right? Tiredness really does create and give us real problems with things like motivation in terms of the stuff we're designing. You could take out car insurance. And it could be taxes. It could be home insurance. It could be the stuff that's really important and we're probably all designing today. But it's the stuff that requires huge amounts of motivation to get up and to want to do. And you know, we've all been there. It's like, oh God, I've got to do this. I feel really tired and distracted, the TV's on. You don't want to do it. So I know what you're thinking. There is some psychology for motivation. This is uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need. You've probably seen this in a presentation by a 50 year old white creative director uh, wearing thick rimmed glasses and Crocs, probably. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy of need. Um, is uh, psychology, and it talks about the importance of various elements. Don't, please don't take any photos of this, all right? I'll tell you why in a minute, all right? Just stop it now. Is we talk about physiological need at the bottom, you've got safety, belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. And this is basically the most important things are at the bottom, and the, you know, it sort of goes up from there. What is the biggest problem with Maslow's hierarchy of need? Have a guess, who was Maslow? Man or a woman? Guess. He was a man, very much so. This study was done in about the fifth. 50s, I think he published this. Um, how old do you think he was, Mr. Maslow? He was in his 60s, yeah. Uh, ethnic background, have a wild guess. White, yeah. Socioeconomic status, rich, yeah, upper middle class. So this is an idea of how we motivate ourselves. These are the things that Maslow believed us as humans build our life, our self-esteem, and everything that we, we, you know, we feel and we motivate ourselves with in our real life. Now, this is, you know, this is true to a certain extent. Which subset of the population is Maslow's hierarchy of need relevant for? Have a guess. Men, rich men who are how old? 50s and 60s, probably American based, because Maslow was American as well, or Western. There is no clear evidence for Maslow's hierarchy of need. All right, so stop using this crap in your stuff, okay? And don't believe every single blog you read that talks about psychology. Go back to read about it and understand what's going on. So in my book, again, I talk about the myths of psychology that are existent in product design. There's lots of them in UX. Lots of myths that we build our lives around and our products around that are actually rubbish. Maslow's hierarchy of need is absolute crap, all right? Absolute rubbish. Again, if you're a woman in Japan, self-actualization is not the thing that's at number one in the list of the thing, you know, your, your, the thing you aspire to in terms of your life. It simply doesn't work that from a cross-cultural point of view, and it certainly doesn't work like that from a sort of demographic point of view in the same way. Okay, 
Let's keep going there. So motivation is a challenging one. Maslow's gives us a clue, not the best clue in the world. All right, here's a bit more about motivation. So this is jam. We call this jam in the UK. What do you call this? Jello? Jelly? Jelly. It's only called jam in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn uh, farmer's markets where you charge like $20, $20 a thing for it. It's, it's jelly, isn't it, normally? Peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Come on, yeah, not, yeah they, give, me, give me something here, America. Yes. <laughs> jelly, right? This was a study that was done uh, in the US, and they did a great study at a farmer's market. They, for the first Saturday of the month, they had six types of jam, jelly, for sale. Then they had 30 the following week. Six the following week, 30 the following week, six, 30, six, 30. All right, of those two experimental conditions at that farmer's market, six or 30, which did they sell more jam, when there were six or when there were 30? Six, of course it was six, obviously. You know why that. Instinctively, all of you, apart from the gentleman at the front down here, knew that it was six, <laughs> all right? Absolutely, completely right. Well, now what was clever about this study is they also went and they did a survey and they asked people, they said, would you prefer to choose from six types of jam or 30 types of jam? Now, what, what do you think pretty much unanimously people said? Six or 30? 30. Almost unanimously, everybody wanted choice. So what does that tell us about the user experience research they're undertaking when you do a survey? Are surveys any good as a user experience research methodology? No. You all know, you all know that in your heart of hearts that there are a load of rubbish, and they're not that bad, they're useful for some things. But behavior, okay, and perceived opinion are wholly and different things when it comes to what people say they're going to do versus what they actually do. The two are not the same, okay? So watching people do and undertake a particular task is going to give you much, much, much deeper insights into how they do something rather than checking a questionnaire out there or a survey, because surveys are cheap, they're quick, and they're easy. All right, back to the jam stuff then. Um, what is the correct way to figure out the right number of choices to give to people? Okay, It's not seven must plus or minus two. That's another myth. You can read that in my book. Um, but here's a great study that helps. So time taken to respond versus number of options. There's a curve here. This is a wonderful piece of psychology. This is called Hick's Law. All right? Hick's Law is fantastic. Okay? So it tells you people are more likely to be quicker, they'll take more, less time to respond, i.e. it's less mental effort for them if there are less options to choose from. Fairly logical stuff, but what's great about this is it not only is there a mathematical thing at the top, don't ask me to explain that, I've got no idea. Um, but there's, there's this you know, psychology principle behind it. Do you know that what's the best thing about Hick's Law? What is the best thing about this? Now, that's true, it is observable. What else, what's the other best thing about Hick's Law? It's a damn law. All right? You pull that bad boy out in a design meeting, nobody is going to mess with you. Hicks Law says we should offer four product selections on the home page. Nobody's going to go, well, I disagree. You, go, you can't disagree with Hicks Law. You throw the mathematics down, they're going to be like, well, okay, four options on that home page. Because people are better at making choices when there are less options out there. Okay? You've got a law, Hicks Law, to back it up. Throw that bad boy down in that next design meeting, all right? So this is what we call in psychology call cognitive load. Okay? When people have to make decisions, they have to think. It raises what we call the cognitive load, and that's a bad thing. All right? Making people think means that people are tired, they're distracted, they're hungry. If all of those things, three things are true, they're going to go off and they're going to use your competitor to do the same task they would have done with you. All right, let's keep going then. So choice is the fourth thing we've talked about here. And all this leads to this particular problem. As I hear this in user research, I want to punch this website in the face, <laughs> all right? So when it's not doing what you want it to do, what you expect it to do, and what you need it to do, all right? You're tired, you're hungry, America's Got Talent is on the TV, you're not going to complete and undertake that car insurance claim. You're going to go and do it with somebody else who's maybe more expensive, but much, much, much easier to use than the stuff you're working on. So this is the psychological principles behind why it's great to have a high quality, easy to use, fantastic user experience. There's the psychology behind it. All right, so let me give you a bit more of a framework to design this stuff around. So I'm gonna to talk to you about two things, interactions and designing user experiences. I'm gonna have now a, a, a pause for you to think about what I've just said while I grab a glass of water. Oh, don't put that in the song either. Don't quote me on that one in that song you're gonna do in a second. That's so going in that song now, isn't it? Mm. 
Yeah, do you see that wry smile then? That's going in, that's going in. Ah, that's going in. Damn it. All right then. Let's look at two things. We've got the micro, psychology and interaction design. All right, the small intricacies of interaction. Do you know this website? You know Wikipedia, don't you? All right, of course you do. This is Wikipedia from 2010, early 2010, specifically Reese Witherspoon's birthday. That's not important, I'm just telling you that. Um, and they were just about to undertake a redesign. Now you're looking at it thinking, ooh, there's some bad stuff going on here. There's one particularly really awful thing on this page here. Look, I'm gonna go and stand next to it here. That's this bad boy here, go versus search. Can you see that thing there? There it is, look, look at that. Ooh, that's cracking, isn't it? Instinctively, you know that's bad, don't you? That's like, oh yeah, right? What's the difference between go and search? Any idea? It's hard, isn't it? Right, if you hit, type Reese Witherspoon in and you hit go, it takes you to Reese Witherspoon's page. If you type Reese Witherspoon in and hit search, you get a list of pages that mention Reese Witherspoon, like Legally Blonde 1, Legally Blonde 2, Legally Blonde 3, I can't think of any more. You get the point, all right? Logically, it makes sense. From a design point of view, it's got a high cognitive load because you've got to make a choice between two buttons, all right? Hicks Law tells us this is bad, all right? That's describing what the problem, what's wrong with it. Let's have a look at how we solve it using psychology. Um, all right, so you're all familiar with, uh, with a compass, right? Okay, I always, north and south, very easy to remember, aren't they? Pretty easy, right? What's the one over here? What's that one? Yeah, <laughs> good, God, you're good. I always get it wrong, because I always think, I was like, never west. How do you remember the points of a compass? Never eat soggy waffles, yes, that's the one. Never eat soggy waffles. Anybody know the UK version? I think somebody said it. Never eat shredded wheat. Anybody know the Australian version? Never eat soggy Weetabix. I've been asking people this. This is, a, this is what we call a mnemonic, all right? And this helps us remember a series of steps by linking each of those steps together to help us remember, what, help us remember the order of the steps that are there. Step one reminds us of step two, reminds us of step three, reminds us of step four. Classically, this is how the human mind works, okay? We don't remember things individually. We remember things much better as part of a sequence when they're linked to something else, all right? That's why it's often hard to remember what's east and west because we're not very good at it. All right, another one. When you're using a screwdriver, which way do you turn it to tighten and which way do you? Righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. All right, if you've never heard that before, that's really useful. All right, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey. Again, that's another mnemonic to help us remember which is which. We're really bad, us humans, at remembering facts like which way that works, which way that doesn't work, okay? We're really bad at that. So we create these systems to help us remember these things. What year was your grand country uh, discovered? 1492, how do you remember which year it is? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Another classic mnemonic to help us remember the facts. That's how our mind works, is we need to link facts together somehow to better remember them. The order, Henry VIII's wives, do you do English history? Of course you do. Uh, Henry VIII's wives, what happened to them? Death, beheaded, died, death, de beheaded, survived. Classic mnemonic, you get it. All right, so we're really bad at facts, declarative knowledge, we're awful at this stuff. What is the capital of Uganda? Somebody's good, Kampala, right? Typically, that's really hard. That takes a lot of mental effort to remember that. That's not, we're not very good as humans at doing that stuff. We're really bad at remembering facts. It takes effort for us to do that. You folks who are developers or have been had a science education, you are much, much better than this, than most people. Because again, most of your education, most of your job relies on you remembering facts. You have to know the thingy thingies for a CSS grid. I don't know those thingy thingies. <laughs> I feel like I should know the thingy thingies after the last two talks, but I'm just not very good at remembering facts, okay? But as a developer, you're trained through your education to do that, all right? Most people don't have the same education as we do, and so really, really bad at facts, okay? You're probably really good at quiz machines, quizzes, all that kind of stuff if you're a developer, because you're just trained to remember facts. Uh, uh, most humans, I don't mean that developers aren't humans, Sorry, I know there's a lot of you out there. You are, obviously you are. I'm gonna stop talking. Don't, don't put that in the song as well, please. <laughs> uh, much better at procedural knowledge, this idea of sequences. Step one reminds us of step two, reminds us of step three, four, five, and six. We remember things in sequence. Order of things helps us remember how they, how they all relate to each other. That's how human memory works, that's how the human brain works, is everything is linked to something else. All right. Bad at facts, good at sequences. Bad at declarative knowledge, 
You want to throw that bad boy down in the meeting, that's really useful. Good at procedural knowledge, all right? So we have two slightly long in the tooth, older ways of opening a mobile phone, right? We've got Apple on the left, we've got, which is obviously a passcode, and then we've got Android on the right, which is a shape, yeah? You're from both familiar with, you're all familiar with these things. One of these is declarative and fact-based more, one of these is more procedural-based, which one is which? Apple is more what? More declarative or more procedural? It is, you have to remember the number, all right? Android is a lot more, which one? Procedural or declarative? Yeah, because you remember the sequence of the steps you go through to do it, okay? Now, nine, something like 90% of American and British passcodes start in the same place, where? Top, top left, why? That's where we're taught as kids to start writing from. Anytime you're given a blank sheet of paper or a blank Microsoft Word document, you start in the top left and you go where? Where do then most Android passcodes go next? To the right, yeah? That's how culturally we've been taught to do it, okay? That's how most passwords work, all right? That's a theory about called object centrality. That's another talk for a different day. But you get the point, all right? Sequences help us remember things together. So with the Android pattern, step one reminds us of what step two is, which reminds us of step three, step four, step five, step six. Each step reminds us of the next one. It's less true of things like pin numbers and passwords. What is the most common password in the world? The word password, yeah? Because again, the word there reminds it. Yeah, some of you said QWERTY. QWERTY is really important. Yeah, really obvious password, because again, it's the sequence and order of the letters on the keyboard. Most common passwords are easy to guess, because they're much more procedural in the way that they are, they work, okay? If a password is declarative or hard to remember, what do people do? They repeat their password, or they write it on a post-it note and stick it on the side of their phone, or the side of their iPad, or the side of their computer for their internet banking. See it all the time in user research, all right? If you're going to design, design for procedural, not declarative knowledge. All right, so back to wi Wikipedia. How can us understanding the difference between declarative and procedural knowledge better improve that search box? Let's talk about it. So procedural knowledge tells us the first thing we do is where do we look for the search box on a, on a website? There's a big clue behind me. Yeah, you look top right. Again, instinctively, that's what we do. That's what we've been taught to do by every single website on desktop that we've always used, okay? With the mobile, so we all go to the top of the page. Same principles apply on desktop and mobile. Desktop's got more real estate, so you have to, you know, procedural knowledge is a lot more important. So you go to the top right, what are you looking for? Yeah, empty box, all right? Or a box that looks like something you can type in, all right? So you're looking for it. Where is it? Well, step one right, the top right. Yeah, oh, there it is. Yeah, have a look for it. What are you looking for next? What's the third thing? What's the third thing you do? Type something in, then what do you do? What are you looking for? The button, obviously the button. All right, you're looking for the button which says something like search. Oh yeah, okay, that's great. I'm gonna go up to the top right, I'm gonna type something in, I'm gonna hit search, off I go. That's the classic procedural knowledge flow that every single user expects when they're, when they're looking for a search box, okay? Problem being, what happens if you do things like you cleverly remove the search box and mean that people just press return or enter to search? What happens? What does it break? It breaks the flow of procedural knowledge. If you start to mess around with the classic flow of how people do things, it breaks the procedural knowledge of how they work. So again, the research I've done, not everybody understands that they can hit return or enter to submit a search box. You see people on a laptop taking off and going to their pad to, right, I'm gonna hit, hit, press the button on their phone, they just dismiss the keyboard, try and get the keyboard out of the way to press the button to hit search. That's what they're looking for. They're not looking to do it from hitting return or even go on the, on the keyboard itself. That's the procedural knowledge flow that people expect. You mess with that, now Wikipedia's got, you know, about two billion users, they're gonna be annoyed at you, all right? Don't mess around with stuff like that. There's no point doing it if you've got two billion users. And the same is true of anything that you're designing. Don't mess around with things like the search box. That's not innovation in the slightest way. That's just annoying people, making them upset because you've changed a really basic interaction just for a bit of innovation. All right, doesn't, simply doesn't work like that. All right, so there's this concept within psychology of axioms, and axioms are a really useful principle for us to talk about in terms of design of digital stuff. So an axiom is a statement or proposition which is regarded as being accepted, established, or self-evidently true. Search box on the top right is a classic design axiom, all right? Most people will know that that is the truth and that's the way it's gonna work. These are different from design patterns. Design patterns are a way of doing things. Design axiom is generally the most accepted 
and best way of doing something. They're different things. Let's talk about some more. So what happens when you hit the uh, logo on any website? What's the design axiom there? What do you expect to happen? Homepage, yeah, absolutely. You wouldn't mess with that. That's a design axiom. Other things, navigation, right? Top or on the left. Classic design axiom. You wouldn't mess with it. Put your own navigation on the right or on the bottom. People aren't going to be able to find it because that procedural knowledge tells them, oh, when I'm looking on the website, I generally go to the top to find the navigation. If you put it somewhere else, you break that flow of procedural knowledge. If people are tired, they're hungry, they're not going to use your stuff, they're going to go and use your competitor or just get annoyed at you. There's no point messing around with this stuff just for the sake of it. Login, top right, same thing. Cart in the basket, top right, same thing. What's the icon you'd use for a cart or a basket on a website? What would you use? Shopping, Shopping cart, yeah, something like that, or a basket. That's what you'd use. You wouldn't mess with that because people are looking for that kind of visual indication in that procedural knowledge flow that tells them, oh, I'm in the right place. Top right, oh, yeah, there it is. Click on that, off I go to the basket. If you mess around with that stuff, you break the procedural knowledge, you increase cognitive load, you annoy people. Language, top right. Stuff like that, very simple stuff. Uh, lots of stuff on the top right, by the way. Don't know how to solve that, but there's a lot of stuff up there. All right, Hamburg, is this, is this a design axiom? Is this self-evidently true that people will understand this thing? No, not in the slightest bit, all right? The hamburger is not an accepted design axiom. You cannot be 100% sure that most of your users will understand this thing and know that there are things behind it. If they're looking for the search box, they're not going to expect to find it behind this bad boy. They are, it's just not going to happen. They're looking for language. They aren't going to find it behind there. They're looking for language that's at the top. If they're looking for certain things, don't put this bad boy in there. All right? One of the best things I did when I worked on a project for MoMA in New York was we removed the hamburger. And we just took the word tickets out of the hamburger and had it as a separate um, item. Mobile ticket sales went up. Who knew? All right? Obvious stuff. Hide stuff behind something that's not a design axiom. It will get lost. By all means, if you're working on a project with loads of stakeholders and thousands of links, it's really, really complicated. Hide stuff in the hamburger menu, because nobody will find it. And all your stakeholders will be really happy, because they're in the main navigation. Useful. That's the only time I'd advocate you use the uh, hamburger menu. Anybody who works here for Marriott, we did that on Marriott.com. It's brilliant. Fantastic. All right. What happened with Wikipedia? The Wikipedia redesigned them. What happened when they changed it? They did change it. Here we go. Duh, duh, duh. There it is. Pretty good. It's better, isn't it? It's better than it was before. Isn't it? It is better than it was before. It's in, it's in the top right. Great. Procedural knowledge. It's got, the word, it's got a text box. Great. It's got the word search. Great. All matching procedural knowledge. But they've taken the button out. Ugh, damn them. Anyway, it's better than it was before. I can talk about why the uh, magnifying glass. Is the magnifying glass a design axiom? It's not. You cannot be 100% sure that everybody's going to understand what that thing means. Thank you, Microsoft Word, with your Zoom function for meaning that this is ambiguous slightly. All right? Again, think about it. Is this a design axiom, yes or no? If you're not sure, don't use it. Just don't. There's no point. Save your mental effort for the important things in the design, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, so it's better. So, wonderful. Wikipedia redesigned the search. Yay, they wrote a lovely blog post, self-congratulatory. Hate those things. Yeah, we designed the search box. Aren't we amazing? High fives, team. Um, <coughs> what happened when they relaunched it? Did it go down well? Uh -uh. And procedural knowledge gives us a clue as to why it didn't. So here's some of the comments on that wonderful blog post they wrote. Search box on the left, please. Left, please. Left, please. Left, please. He wrote that quite a lot of times. All right. George Schultz, 97% of all people want the search box on the left-hand side. When will this finally be fixed? George Schultz later went on for a career in the Trump campaign. Uh, obviously, 97% of people don't want that back. Why was George Schultz annoyed? Why? Yes, it was changed, but why? What had he built up? He bu exactly, he built up an incorrect... Wikipedia had helped him build up a procedural knowledge flow of how search worked. He expected search to be on the left. He expected two buttons, go and search. He was taught by Wikipedia how to do it. So when it was changed so it would be better for new people coming on board, it broke the existing procedural knowledge steps of existing users, and they hated it. So again, when you're redesigning, expect people to hate it. We all know people hate change. This is why. Because we break their existing procedural knowledge flows of how they do something. They've spent time and effort learning how our crappy existing interaction works. And then we change it. They're like, oh, but I spent all that time and effort doing this. All right? Even though it's better, people will hate it. 
Tell your stakeholders this story. Tell your bosses this story before you redesign anything, but people will hate it, all right? Horrible if you spent and put your, poured your time and love and energy into this stuff. People hated it, but it will happen. It'll die down after about two weeks, but it will definitely happen. So this is one of the things I do. Is I, I, uh, one of the services I offer my clients is, is, a, is a product called Oh Shit, um, which is basically when something's gone wrong, like you've relaunched and this has happened, or your stock value's gone down. I worked with the UK supermarket a couple of years ago. They relaunched, and this happened. Stock price dived. They lost like something like 3% of their, uh, their market valuation. Million, you know, millions knocked off the top of this company. Got this call. I went in and said, just hang, hang tight for two weeks. It'll be fine. And it was. And it's fantastic. So you know, understanding this is going to happen. Don't back down, but understand this is going to happen. It's going to make, you, make your lives a lot better as designers and as better as a team. All right, then. How are we doing? We, energy levels all right? Because I know before lunch. All right, I'm going to talk to you then about how to innovate. Because basically, I've just told you, right, go and copy how everybody else does it for search and any other interaction you've got, basket, shopping basket, navigation. Just go and copy everybody else, which is really unexciting, isn't it, as a designer, as a developer. You're like, oh, God, just got to go and copy what everybody else is doing. I'm going to have a sip of water, and I'll tell you how to innovate, all right? This is, this is building excitement, is it not? <laughs> all right, let's keep going then. So... This is a cafe in Paris. Paris. Any French people in the house today? Ah, oh, hello, yes. Oh, you do cafes so well. Um, this is a cafe in Paris on, uh, by the Seine on the north bank of the Seine. Um, famous cafe. This is where... Um, uh, oh, what's his name? What's the name of that American writer? Hemingway. Hemingway was, was writing away in his moleskins in the back of this place. Um, now... There's a, there's a design axiom here that tells us how to use this particular, how to interact with this particular uh, cafe. What's the design axiom that tells us what to do? The boards, number one, absolutely true. The boards, the menu boards, what do they tell you to do? What do they stop you from doing? What, sitting down, yeah, you sort of go up and look at the boards. What, what's the other big design axiom that's standing there that's probably about six foot two and slightly grumpy? The waiter, absolutely. So he's there. You see the waiter there. What does that tell you? You've got to wait. <laughs> yeah, especially in Parisian cafe. Sorry, French people. Um, yeah, you've got, again, you've got to go up to him. He'll probably try and sit you down. But it's table service. That's what it's telling you. You go and sit down. That's the axiom that tells you what to do. But, however, something like, well, actually, what happens, the order of things is you go and sit down. You know, you, you go, oh. Waiter comes, brings the menu. You order your coffee. He uh, brings your coffee back, don't know, and you know, you do enjoy your coffee. Then what do you do when you finished your coffee? What do you do to finish? Yeah, you ask for the check, comes in, gives you the check, you wait for the time, you pay, and you leave, and off you go. Except, actually, what he does, if, if he spots you are an American or you're a Brit in this French cafe, when does he ask you to pay for your coffee? immediately as he brings it to you. But if you're French, you have to ask for the check at the end, and you pay then. Why? Yes, of course it does. Obviously, that's the best way of doing it. It's not because he hates Americans. Obviously not. Well, he probably you might do a little bit, but <laughs> that's not the reason he does it. Oh, God, that's going to go in the song, isn't it? Oh, don't, please don't put that in the song. I, I love Americans. I love Americans. <laughs> That can go in, yeah? All right, anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, he brings you a bill then. Because again, where did we all learn to order coffee? Who taught us how to drink and order coffee? Starbucks, Starbucks right, absolutely true. So, <laughs> sorry, Pete's coffee. <laughs> What's the design axiom here that tells us what mental model to use? What's the design axiom here? It's the counter and it's the line, yeah, the cue or the line. Those two things tell us what to do. They tell us how to behave, okay? That's a classic design axiom that tells us what to do, all right? So again, you see the line, you see the counter. Where's the counter in this? Whoa, hey, whoa. Well, that's not good. That's because I bad mouth the French. <laughs> all right, where's the counter in here? Right at the back. Does it matter? Do you need to go to the counter to do anything? No, you don't need to do anything here. Here, you do everything. And you pay, you go, you queue up, you choose, can I have a... Triple latte with something sh vanilla shot, please, grande, whatever the words are you use at Starbucks. Um, and then they say, yeah, that'll be five bucks or whatever it is. That's quite cheap for coffee these days, like eight bucks for, for that. 
then you pay right there and then, don't you? That's the classic mentor model we've all got of how we buy, buy coffee. We go, we stand up at the counter, we oh, order our drink, we pay right then, we go and sit down and we do it. What happened when they, they opened the Starbucks in Paris? What was the problem? What did people do? They went and sat down. Yeah, absolutely, because the mental model they had of how coffee shops and cafes work was built from places like this. They went and sat down and went, what's the fuss about? The service here is terrible. <laughs> what's going on? They had to put signs on the table that said, please go and order at the counter. All right? you notice I didn't do that in a really bad French accent. I could have done, but that would almost certainly would have gone in the remake. All right, this is a fundamental about how we as humans build and understand the world around us. We build models of the world. All right? So we build models of coffee shops, hotels, and we take them to the next version of that that we encounter, all right? Saves us time and effort and makes us more adaptable to the world that's around us. We take a mental model of how something works and we apply it to new or novel situations. That's how we think and remember and understand and how we behave. So anytime you go and change that mental model, it causes all kinds of confusion and, you know, people walk, up, walk out with, without paying at a a cafe like this, which is, we've all been there. Did we pay? We paid yet? We paid yet? Those are the sorts of conversations people have in these places because the mental model is not exactly right of how it works. The same is true here. Starbucks has helped us create the mental model, and they own the mental model of how to order a coffee and how we do it. So we take it any time we start um, work with a coffee shop. In fact, again, if you're going to start a new coffee shop, which model would you copy? This one or this one? Starbucks, you would copy Starbucks because that's the one that everybody, all the existing coffee buyers are going to use. Now that fits really well in terms of digital design because it's, if we understand how people think and operate and understand the world, we can design better products to meet the world's mental models. Right, let's do a quick thing together. I've got three minutes, 45 seconds to do it. All right, we're going to go away for the weekend. Let's build a quick mental model of how we go away for the weekend. All right, this is a typical, I've done loads of user research on this. This is a typical conversation about how people plan a weekend away. They don't do it at Starbucks, sorry about that, wrong button. Uh, all right, so they decide what we're going to do. Let, wh where are we going to go? We're going to go to the beach, uh, city, ski, spa. What kind of weekend do we fancy? I don't know what that was. Um, <laughs> beach, city, ski, spa. You know, that's the sort of conversation. Man, what do you fancy? Oh, I fancy this. I feel, yeah, let's do some shopping, uh, all this kind of stuff, all right? You decide when you're going to go. You want to go a weekend in July. What, if you're going to go away the weekend with your partner, which weekend would you avoid in July? The fourth, because you know it's going to be expensive, wouldn't you? You'd say, let's maybe go the weekend before, because you know it'll be cheaper the weekend afterwards. Maybe it'll be a bit cheaper. You avoid the fourth. So maybe you go last weekend in June, second weekend in July, maybe the third weekend in July. You avoid things like school vacation times, because you know it's going to be more expensive. Those are the things that go through your head when you're trying to plan a weekend away. Other things, like when does the weekend start? For us Brits and uh, uh, the French, we start maybe on a Thursday and we go through to a Sunday. You know, maybe we'll go from Friday to a Monday. Depends how much time you can get off work. Maybe a weekend starts... Friday night, Thursday night, through to Sunday night, maybe Monday night, depending on how much time you can take off work. A weekend and a definition of a long weekend is slightly flexible. And these are the conversations people have. Other things. Um, so we decide when, how far we're going to go away. Do we say things like, oh, you know, so let's go away for vacation for the weekend. Let's do the, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Should we go 400 miles or 600 miles? Do you ever have that conversation? You don't, do you? How do you measure distance when it comes to travel? Time, always. Yeah, let's fly maybe two or three hours, or you, cra you Americans are crazy. You like drive 12 hours for a weekend, don't you? <laughs> we don't do that in the UK. That's a bit crazy. But you get the point. You, three or four hours away is something that you do because you're only going to go away for the weekend. That's how people measure distance and time when they're looking for booking and tra a travel or a vacation away at the weekend. All right? So they're pretty much here is a classic mental model of how people book a weekend away. Really simple stuff. If you work for a travel company, right, this is gold, by the way. Um, so let's take this mental model and we, we get, come up with a statement. Let's go to the beach, fly maybe three hours on the first or the second weekend in July. That's maybe how we're going to do it. We take that mental model and then we apply it to a travel website. Uh, sorry if you work for Expedia, I do apologize. Taking that mental model, evaluate with Expedia for me. Have a think about it. How are Expedia doing? Take that mental model. How does the mental model and Expedia fit? Do they fit together? No, they don't. They don't at all. Can you, wouldn't it be great? So, you know, you think, well, well it'd be great to be able to choose ski holidays or beach holidays. Can I, oh, beach is there. That's good at something at least. First, so can you choose, look, look at the dates, for example. So these dates are in British format anyway. Uh, D-D-M-M-Y-Y. -Y. You've got to be very, very exact about the dates that you're choosing. So again, first or second weekend in July doesn't fit. Maybe go away Thursday, Friday, doesn't fit. 
None of these things fit, all right? So this is a great way of evaluating how you or your competitor is doing to understand the mental model, and immediately, from a hugely high-level user experience business point of view, you can see what mistakes Expedia are making, all right? It doesn't matter about the procedural knowledge of where the buttons are and all that. The procedural knowledge of Expedia is really good. All the processes, the buttons, the words, the micro-interactions are great. But the user experience could be much, much better, and the mental model gives us the clues as to how to better improve that user experience. So again, if you're going to redesign a travel website, Expedia, what ideas have you got? Based on the mental model, what could you do? What would be a great thing to be able to do? You see, you enter, you enter San Francisco as the start, Yeah, show me places three hours flight from San Francisco on the second weekend of July. That would be absolute gold, wouldn't it? Three hours flight away from San Francisco on the third weekend in July. That would be a great way to look for holidays. Or vaca sorry, vacations. Is it? You get the point. And this is the best way to use psychology to, to innovate. That is a fantastic innovation, is giving people the ability to search by distance in hours, flight hours away from where they are. All right? That is innovation in its very, very classic form, because you know there's a need for it, the mental model tells you that, and it tells you prescriptively what to do about it to better meet user needs. So mental models are fantastic. Um, His booking.com, they do it better. All right, so if you're gonna remember one thing today, do take away this from me, never eat soggy waffles, all right? That's the number one takeaway from today. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna leave you with this, which is a, an uplifting psychology quote. Uh, a designer who doesn't understand psychology is going to be no more successful than an architect who doesn't understand physics, all right? This is a quote from a very, very intelligent psychologist. <laughs> uh, Mr. Joe, by the way, that fits into 140 characters on Twitter, not that it matters anymore. If you want to take a photo of me, this is a really good photo to take. <laughs> me pointing at this, looking in intent. <laughs> Tweets really well, you'll get loads of retweets, people will love you. But it's true. Psychology is going to help you better understand how to use procedural knowledge to design better interactions. Psychology can help you with mental models to design better user experiences. You can use those mental models to evaluate how well you're doing and to generate new ideas, all from some really, really basic psychology principles about how people think, behave, and build models of the world. So thanks very much, ladies and gentlemen. You can clap now. Come on. Thank you very much, Joe. Yeah. It's all here, right? Oh, slides are at the top. Hold on, hold on, hold on, Chris at the back. Go for it. I'm on Twitter. Drop me an email. I love to talk, as you can guess. Talk to me today and tomorrow, all right? Yeah. I'd love to chat. Because the most important thing for me at these conferences is chatting to all you guys. You're going to come and ask me questions about mental models of, like, crazy stuff. I will help you with that. So please come talk to me today. And all the stuff you need is from here. I've just tweeted my slides on the Smashing Conf hashtag, so you can find them anyway. Oh, right, let's talk, right? Should, awesome. do, I, do I sit here? Yep, yep. All right, you can put the other slide up, uh, Chris, at the back. And by the way, all, all the speakers, uh, we encourage you to be outside during the lunch session so that you can yeah, I'll uh, be around. Please have do talk chats to with me. the audience. Look so. at me, I look so young there, don't I? <laughs> Quite tired, my wife, isn't it? By the way, get his book. His book is awesome. Yeah, only, only four bucks. There you go. Buy it, don't, don't necessarily read it. That's a cup of coffee. <laughs> all right, great talk. Thanks. You know, I, I, I guess I was privileged because I, I got to host you on Smashing TV, and so I got to see this ahead of time. So, and, and it was a great conversation. You know, I was monitoring the questions from the audience. Yeah. And there was one, and I, I know we have our own list of questions that we wanted to ask you, but there was one that just really stood out, and it's, uh, I, I felt like I needed to ask you. So how do you innovate within UX without violating the user's trust? Is it ever appropriate to piss off a user and upset the commonplace procedural knowledge? Yes, you can do it. So I work for a travel company. so. Procedural knowledge flow for where a search box goes on a desktop version of a website is search box for travel goes on the left-hand side. Traditionally, that's the procedural knowledge flow. And the stuff on the right-hand side is normally an ad or a, um, you know, a hero image of something that's important. We had the hypothesis that we flipped them around. More people would click on the offers yes. and less people would search for deals. It's true. We moved the two around and offers got much more of uh, increase in usage and searches were less common. Um, so you can do it. And you can do clever things like, um, if you know you've got a high volume of people searching for stuff on your website, you can put little ads or little notes under the search box to say, hey, latest product is this thing. You can actually hijack people on their procedural knowledge flows to give little messages alongside the interactions that you know are going to work. So people are using search heavily. They'll see that when they're going to be using search. So you can just understand it and use it and just put the messaging in that, 
uh, points that you kind of need it. But at what point is the pain threshold acceptable? Because uh, acceptable? Because you mentioned, for example, the the change that was uh, with your client. You said wait two weeks, it'll yeah. be fine. But at w what is the pain threshold that you say, hey, I, you know, we gotta we gotta change things back? It depends. I mean, if you're measuring, if you're an e-commerce company, it's got to be the dollar. The dollar dips, yeah. and again, if you're doing multi or A/B testing, you know you test something before it went live and understand that people aren't going to like it, and there's going to mm -hmm. be a bit of a dip before you launch it, and then hopefully it will recover. So you can use multivariate A/B testing to get there. I mean, one thing never piss users off because again, if people are annoyed, they'll go and use your competitor, and you'll right. you'll, you'll get you'll get less money. But you can do it, but you've got you've got to understand and maybe project that over time, and you can do that by like maybe five percent of your traffic goes to uh, the new version of your site until you evolve it, so right. you annoy them less and less. So yep. don't. I mean. All right, yeah, okay. Any other common questions? I just expect people to mention my uh, little bag here, my little fanny bag. <laughs> nobody's, nobody's mentioned that so far. So maybe that'll be on the tweets, I don't know. <laughs> All right, how do you Trying differentiate common sense procedural knowledge from a stagnant status quo? Um, and this is again another. Status, somebody, somebody's quite annoyed. Stagnant status quo. Yeah. I mean, again, the, the place to innovate and to put your design effort and thinking is not into a procedural knowledge flow for a search box. Bang that bad boy out. Get the procedural knowledge flow, spot it out, design it. Design effort, mm -hmm. thought should be going into the mental model to innovate through understanding what the mental model is. Don't sweat the details too much. Use procedural knowledge to help you get to the details. Sweat the big stuff like user experiences, like traveling, you know, a, uh, an option to search for destinations three hours away from where I live. That's the thing that's worth breaking. That's the status quo that's worth breaking. Yep. That kind of massive mental model of how people um, understand the mental model and then breaking the um, way that everybody else does it to give them something that they really need. Don't mess around with things like buttons and search, search boxes. That's not where innovation is. Just do that. Just crank that stuff out. Innovate through user experience, not through interaction design. Gotcha. You know, in, as, as somebody asks, and you know, I think it's a good question, would you consider Amazon to be a, a, a site that's driven by procedural knowledge? Amazon's in the law unto itself, really. I mean, yes. I think... Amazon have a unique way of doing most things. They don't really adhere to the standards that most others really work towards. So the, the way they divide and design interactions is slightly different. Um, and I'd never say things like their login on login and register on Amazon is dreadful, a horrible user <laughs> experience. Um, but again, you have to understand that, that for Amazon, that's not something they're driving towards. They're not driving to get new users. They're driving to get more value out of existing users. That's the way they work. And certainly if the what Amazon offer is you basically you can get your product as soon as you want and for a really, really good price. So you'll be prepared to put up with a bit of pain for getting that thing cheaply mm -hmm. and getting it, you know, getting those diapers for your baby that evening rather than going from somebody who's got much better design. So it's a trade-off between other factors like price and convenience. User experience is the third thing that sits alongside them and can compete. But, you know, it's never going to compete on quality of service and price. User experience, can, it's really hard to then adjust and fight against that sort of stuff. Really. Right. It's hard. No, it definitely is. I, I, um, I can attest to that one. Let's talk about um, different countries. Uh, yeah. The user experiences that you see in different countries obviously vary. And, and so the question is, Asia and Europe in terms of UX, obviously they're different, but what exactly is that difference? What are the cultural differences? What are the philosophical differences? Even the theoretical differences that are out there. Yeah. So my background is I used to be, I was a, an elementary school teacher and I taught a lot in Asia, across Europe. And then when I came into user experience design, I, um, I worked with a lot of multinational companies to mm -hmm. then effectively do user research and to, to plan out product rollouts around the world. So the Marriott I launched in 18 countries in different languages. We did loads of user research in different countries to understand mental models, and to understand is the mental model the same across most cultures and countries. And generally it is. Most mental models of how things happen are generally the same in terms of digital stuff. You know, there's obviously differences in terms of coffee that I just talked about. But again, understanding the mental model is where um, it's generally the same. The differences tend to come in terms of small interaction design changes that tend to differ between different countries. Um, so you'd see certainly within aesthetic them changing slightly, and certainly in terms of what words and um, interactions, so the, the words and the support text around interactions change and differ from country to country. So a good example would be in the hotel world is that you know, for example, Japanese businessmen don't like to necessarily book Western hotels because they don't think that the Western hotels will offer the same services that Japanese hotels have. Like, so classically, in a Japanese hotel, you're given Japanese travelers don't travel. This is really broad brush. Don't travel with, with a toothbrush. They like to use the toothbrush that the hotel gives them. But they're like, well, if I go to an American hotel, are they going to give me a toothbrush? 
And so that's one of the questions that they'll have around how the operation the thing works. So typically, cross-culturally, the stuff that we tend to see changing is microcopy around the features and benefits of the product rather than necessarily the interaction of how you buy and operate that product. Well, thank you so much for your session.